Hello. So today's topic is on searching. On Wednesday's topic, we talked about sorting, computers putting things in order with the example of merge sort as an algorithm that does that. But something else we also often ask computers to do is to search for things, uh, to find a file we're looking for, to search Google for the answer to a question. And there are many ways that computers search for things and we're going to focus on two of them in this topic. So one of our learning goals is that you will be able to efficiently search a sorted list using an algorithm called binary search. You may have encountered this before, but if you haven't, you're in for a treat. And our second learning goal is that we're going to use a technique called recursive backtracking to search for possible solutions to a problem. So let's say we're playing a guessing game. And I say, I'm thinking of a number between one and 100, and I don't wanna make things too easy for you, so I'm not gonna give you any hints. And all I'm gonna tell you when you guess a number is whether you've got the number that I'm thinking of or not. What strategy would you use to play this game? Well, given that I'm not gonna tell you anything other than you got it right or not, you might as well guess one and then guess two and then guess three and so on and just try all the numbers between one and a hundred. If we were to make this a little more general, I might say I'm going to pick a number between one and n and sometimes you might get lucky and get that and guess the number right away and other times you might have to go through all n numbers to get to the one that I'm thinking of. On average you're going to need to guess about n divided by two numbers, if I'm picking something kind of at random between one and n, uh, and you're just guessing them, uh, guessing them all, on average it's going to take n divided by two tries before you get the one that I chose. Uh, and this means that that guessing strategy is going to be big O of n, right? It's going to be a linear search through all the possible, uh, th through, through all the possible numbers that I might have chose. And, you know, that's, that's all well and good, uh, but you might say, well, look, Aaron, just guessing all the numbers is not a very fun game, and I admit that's true. So let's say I'm going to give you a hint every time that you have a wrong guess, and specifically I'm going to tell you whether the number I'm thinking of is higher than the one you guessed or lower than the one that you guessed. Now, would this change the strategy that you would use to try and get the number that I'm thinking of? Well, a good way to take advantage of these new rules of the game would be to guess something in the middle of the range of possible numbers. So if it's between 1 and n, you might guess n divided by 2 as your first guess. And I'm going to tell you that's higher or lower, uh, that, that the number I'm thinking of is higher or lower than the one you guessed. And this is going to mean that if I say higher, you can now rule out the lower half of the possibilities. If you guess n over 2 and I say it's higher, you're like, well, it's not less than n over 2. And if I say lower, you can rule out, rule out the higher half of the possibilities. And you might continue this guessing in the middle strategy each time ruling out half of the remaining numbers. Now, this seems like it's going to be a lot faster than just guessing every single number uh, trying to find the one I choose. But let's be mathematical about how much faster it is and how many steps might involve uh, in terms of every time you cut the set of possible answers in half. Well, if you start with n possible answers, uh, n possible numbers I might have chosen, eventually you'll get down to, to the one that I chose. And uh, the number of steps this is going to take is going to be we have n and we divide it in half and we divide it in half again and we divide it in half, and so on, and eventually we're going to divide it in half enough times that we're down to just a single, the single number that I'm thinking of. And all these divisions by 2, we can, they're all on the denominator, uh, they're all dividing in, so we can multiply them all together, and we get n divided by 2 to some power x, let's call it x, uh, and that equals 1. Do a bit of algebra, multiply both sides by 2 to the x, we have n equals 2 to the x. And uh, this is where our friend the logarithm comes in, is that if we have n equals 2 to some power, we can say that that power is log of n. 
And so in a bigger log base two event, and this means that our guessing in the middle strategy is going to be logarithmic uh, in terms of the amount of work it's going to take, the number of guesses uh, it's going to take in order to find the number I'm thinking of. And this is what is called binary search. So how would these two search strategies, linear search and binary search, uh, work in terms of uh, something we might search through in code like an array? So we have our array. And we have our values inside of it. And let's say if we're searching for a particular number and we're doing linear search, we might, uh, we have an, ar ar an array nums and we have a variable i and we make it zero and we have a number that we're looking for and let's say that that number is eight. So start off by at zero, and we're going to check each element of the array against our target, so nums i3, and then we have target equals equals nums i. We want to, once we have found this to be true, then we found the number we're looking for in our list. And we're just going to uh, linear search through our list, trying each one. The one in index i, 3 does not equal 8. So then we change i to 1, which changes nums i to 7. That doesn't equal target. Move to the next one. And the next one, once we're at index 4, the element there is 8. Commit as a target, that's true, and we have found our value. And so we might do this with a, uh, a for loop. So on the screen, I have this uh, contains method that's going to return true or false if our target is in our array nums. I've just written a for loop with an if statement in it that uh, checks the, this condition of whether we found the target. And if we get all the way through the loop, never having uh, returned true because we found an array element that matched our target number, that means the array does not contain the target number and we would return false, indicating that this array does not contain target. So this would be our big O of N linear search through our list to find a target number. And we might ask, all right, under what circumstances could we use this that binary search strategy of checking the middle and then ruling out half of them and then checking the middle of the remaining half and so on. Because we don't have another person uh, when we're writing a method to say higher or lower. So we're going to need to rely on some property of the list. And the key thing that we will rely on is that the list needs to be sorted. In order to use binary search on a list, the list needs to be sorted so that we can compare what we're looking for to a particular element and know which half of our list we should look in next. That if we just compare target to what's in the middle of this list, we wouldn't, because it's all jumbled up, we wouldn't know which side we should look at. But If we have one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, now in our, and we're looking for target eight, now we can use the binary search technique. And to do this, I'm going to have a 
variable low, which is going to start out at zero. Uh, that is the lowest index, that is the portion of the list we're currently searching over. And I'm going to have high, which is the maximum index of the portion of the list we're currently searching over. And this is going to start at the end of the list, which I believe will be index 7 for an 8 element array. And so our low and high start off saying, all right, we're, uh, the current portion of the list we're searching is the whole list. And then I'm going to say, all right, mid equals low plus high divided by 2. And all of these are integers, so this division is going to round, uh, going to round down. And this will serve to uh, compute the index that is the middle of our list. So 0 plus 7 divided by 2 uh, is going to be 3 at the start here. And then we're going to say, all right, nums at mid, is this greater than target? Is it less than target? Is it equal to target? And in each of these cases, we're going to do different things. For equal target, we're going to return true. Because if, if the number at the middle index we're, we're considering equals the target, we found it, it's contained in the list. When the midpoint is greater than the target, this means that we should consider the smaller half of the list, because the thing in the middle of our sorted list is bigger than what we're looking for. And so this is going to cause us to say the high, the, the largest index that we're looking for is now the middle that we were looking at minus one. So this will cause us to consider the, the lower half, and, and you'll, see, you'll see how this will work in a moment. And similarly, when the target is greater than the midpoint, we want, we want to consider the upper half and so we're going to move low up to one past the midpoint. So let's, now that we have uh, these uh, uh, cases in place, let's uh, go through how this is going to work. So we start off with mid at 3. We look uh, at the number at index 3. 4 is less than our target. So we're going to say low equals mid plus 1. Our mid is 3, so low becomes 4. And we do it again. We say low plus high is 11, divided by 2 is 5.5, which is going to round down to 5. And 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 7, again, less than. Uh, our target, so low again becomes uh, mid plus one, move that up to six. And so you see how if we're considering, we were considering from four to the end of our array, and we tried seven, and we found that it was less than our target, so then we only want to consider stuff to the right of seven, so then we move low from four to 6. All right, I'll go ahead and write the indexes. And so now for index 6, 6 plus 7 is 13 divided by 2 is 6 and a half, round down to 6. We look at index 6, that's 8, that matches our target, that returns true. So, we can uh, use these adjustments to, to do this process of ruling out half, uh, the, the half of the remaining list that we know won't contain the value we're looking for. Uh, but what's not included here is how do we know when to stop. So 
let's go through an example. where we were, say, looking for 0. So again, our low and high start considering the full list. And our mid starts at 3. Our target is now less than. So we say uh, high is mid minus 1. So. This bigger than our target, we only want to consider what's over here. So if we set our high to our mid minus 1, that's going to uh, have us only considering the lower half of the list. Our mid is then 0 plus 2 over 2, so that's 1. OK, the element at index 1 is again less. So we're again going to have high be uh, mid minus 1. So high and low are, z are both 0. And uh, that means that when we add them together and divide by 2, that's also 0. And this is still fine, because we haven't checked the number at index 0 yet. So we still want to be able to do this. So we don't want to stop when high and low are equal. That's OK, because that's getting us down to a single place in the list. We're considering a single element. And that might be the single element we're looking for. In this case, it's not. So we update, and it's still greater than our target. So we update uh, using our, our formula here. High equals mid minus 1. So it's going to make high minus 1. And at this point, the low index 0 is bigger than the high index negative 1. And this is going to be the point where we want to stop our search. When high and low pass each other, that's going to mean, all right, we've exhausted the possible places for us to search, and we know that the element we're looking for is not in the list. So to see this in code, I have it on the screen here, a sorted contains method, which, like my example on the board, has a, a low and a high. and this process that I was acting out, computing the midpoint and comparing the target to what we find at the midpoint and adjusting low and high, this is going to take place inside a while loop, kind of while low and high have not passed each other. So while low is less than or equal to high, we're going to keep looking. And uh, if that is ever false, we know that the, that the number is not in our array and we can return false. Uh, also in the notes is a recursive version of this binary search, uh, though I, I won't go through that in the video in the interest of time. So that was binary search, an efficient algorithm for searching through a sorted list. And as I said at the beginning, that's going to be big O log N, which is going to be significantly better than a linear search uh, that doesn't take advantage of the fact that the list is sorted. Of course, binary search can only be used when the list is sorted, and as I mentioned in the sorting video, uh, no sorting algorithm uh, in the general case is going to be better than big O of n times log n. So sorting a list and doing one search is going to be worse than one linear search. If we're sorting once and doing a ton of searches on the same sorted list, then that's probably worth it. All right. On to recursive backtracking. So backtracking is a kind of search, but instead of searching through a list, we're going to be searching possible solutions to a problem. Uh, as a way to get into it, let's talk about a kind of brute force approach to searching through solutions to a problem that we might call exhaustive search, that's going to search every single possibility. So, one example might be, suppose we want to generate all three-digit numbers that are composed of the digits 1, 2, and 3. And we might start uh, writing them down, 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, 1, 3, 3, 3, 3, 2, 1. And if we were doing this in code, we might write a kind of triply nested for loop like this. Right? We choose a digit, uh, 1, then 2, then 3. And given that choice, we choose a second digit, 1, 2, then 3. and for that choice, we choose a third digit, one, two, and three, and we just print them all out 
one after another. And uh, this will enumerate all the three digit numbers composed of one, two, or three. Uh, and, and this is a decent way of thinking about exhaustive search. We're kind of exploring the different choices we could make in uh, coming up with three digit numbers, right? We're choosing what the first digit is, then choosing what the second is, then choosing what the third is, and through these loops, going through all possible choices we might make uh, for each digit. And we might draw this as a diagram where uh, each time we make a choice, we're kind of flowing through this diagram following these arrows so we can choose one is the first digit, and then from there we can choose one is the second digit, and from there we can choose one is the third digit. We might also choose two is the third digit or three is the third digit. Instead of one is the second digit, we might choose one is two is the second digit, and so on. So this is a kind of visual way to see all these possible choices that we could make in terms of these three digit numbers. In backtracking, an additional idea that we don't tend to incorporate into the kind of exhaustive search that uh, I applied to finding those three digit numbers is that we want to stop exploring when we want to stop trying new choices uh, when we hit a dead end, meaning when we get to a point where no solution is possible, even no matter what choice we make, where we're done and we don't need to keep uh, trying new choices from that point. So suppose that we have uh, uh, the Cartesian plane, 2D, 2D plane, X and Y, and we're starting at the origin, 0, 0, and we want to get to the point uh, 1, 2, 1 on the x-axis, 2 on the y-axis. And we're limited to three kinds of moves. Uh, we can move north, meaning 1 in the y direction. We can move east, meaning 1 in the x direction. And we can move northeast, one in the x and y direction. And if we look at this and start kind of thinking through, all right, we could move north and then north and then east or northeast and then north and so on, we might uh, kind of work out that there are five possible solutions to getting from zero, zero to one, two. We can move they basically involve moving north twice and east once in the various combinations of north, east, and northeast that would result uh, in those. But how would we write a program to find these answers? Uh, and this is exactly the kind of thing where backtracking works nicely. Uh, and the idea is that there's some set of possible answers that we want to explore. Uh, and we're going to try and view this problem as this sequence of choices. Uh, and this sort of view of a sequence of choices is often called a decision tree and a kind of diagram that visualizes many possible sequences of choices. So here's an example from the webcomic XKCD. It poses a question, should I put solar panels on it? And then at kind of each stage of this decision tree, we're answering another question. Does it move around? Yes. Does it have a regular chance to recharge or swap batteries? No or yes. If it does swap batteries, then we probably don't need solar panels. If it doesn't, when running, is it, when running, is it hot to the touch? If it isn't, then maybe you can put solar panels on it. If it is hot, yeah, good luck getting, uh, getting the solar panels to, to function well. And so there are different kind of pathways, different sets of choices uh, that we can make through this decision tree. And in general, decision trees are going to have the form that will have kind of a choice and then some number of possibilities for that choice is kind of the descendants of that choice in this decision tree. Uh, and so the first possibility, second possibility, and so on. So if we make a decision tree for all possible sequences of two moves in this uh, problem where we, where we start at zero, zero, we can move north, east, or northeast, you can see that at each kind of level of this decision tree, we have our kind of three choices. So we can move north, east, or northeast. If we move north, we can again move north, east, or northeast. And kind of in each of these, we're keeping track of, all right, what is the solution so far? So kind of this point, we've got north and east, and we're at position 1-1. One, one. So what happens in backtracking is we explore specific choices until we reach a dead end. And if we find some path is not working out, we're going to back up to the last choice we made and try a different choice. And that's where this 
idea of backtracking comes from. Uh, and you might think of if you were physically trying to find your way out of a maze, you might try going down one pathway, and if you hit a dead end, you might backtrack to like the last intersection in the maze that you passed and try going a different direction. And this is the exact idea we're talking about. You explore one way, you hit a dead end, you back up and try a different choice. And so we can look at a diagram of of how we would apply backtracking uh, to this problem of getting from 0, 0 uh, to 1, 2. And so what this diagram shows is that it stops exploring once it gets to a point that from which it is no longer possible to get to where we are trying to go. So for example, as soon as we get to 2 on the x direction, we've gone too far, and it's not possible with our three moves of east, north, and northeast to get to the target location of 1, 2. So all of these uh, points where we have uh, 2 in the x, we didn't continue exploring from there because we know that that's a dead end. Similarly, once we get to 3 on the, on the y-axis, we know that's a dead end. And through this sort of exploration, the nodes, the, the solutions highlighted in uh, red here are the five different ways that we can get to 1, 2. To demonstrate the power of backtracking, let's solve a classic problem known as eight queens. The challenge is to put eight queens on a chessboard where no two queens are going to threaten each other. And because in chess, uh, on a grid, If we have a queen, queens in chess can move in all directions. They can move diagonally, they can move horizontally, they can move vertically. So on a chessboard, you can see why it would be challenging to try and put eight queens on an eight by eight board with none of them threatening each other. So let's consider a simpler problem. where we just have 4 by 4. And let's say I put a queen uh, in the corner here. Pause the video and see if you can try and come up with a way to put four queens onto this board uh, such that they wouldn't threaten each other. Alright, you may have been able to get three queens onto this board with no two threatening each other, uh, but not four. And that's because I purposely led you down a bad path. There is no solution where a queen is in the corner. Uh, and so if we actually wanted to put four queens on a four by four board, we would need to do something like put a queen here, a queen here, a queen here, and a queen here. And now none of the queens are threatening each other. They're not sharing any row or column or diagonal. Uh, and so this is a possible solution to our 4x4 four four board. And it turns out that uh, humans can be kind of intuitively good at solving problems like these, kind of seeing uh, the relationships involved. Uh, but computers absolutely do not have that intuition. And they just have to explore all sorts of possibilities. And that's where uh, our backtracking is going to come in. So if we're thinking about the decision tree for our uh, eight queens problem, we might think of, well, when we place the first queen, we have uh, 64 possibilities, 64 different squares on our eight by eight board. And then uh, after we've placed one, we then have 63 different squares for the second queen uh, and, and so on. Um, but we can be a little bit smarter than that about how we uh, consider these choices because we know that no queen uh, can be in the same row or column. So what we're actually going to do is to, uh, for the first column, choose a row to put the queen in. Then for the second column, choose a row to put a queen in and so on. So our decision tree uh, we'll start off with something like choice for column one, and we have the eight different rows 
uh, in our 8x8 board to choose from. And kind of once we choose a specific row, say row 5, we then have to make a choice for column 2, which again has 8 rows to choose from, uh, and so on. And for kind of each of these uh, eight branches in our decision tree, one of eight rows, uh, we might be able to nicely code that up in, in a for loop for uh, row equals one uh, up to row uh, less than or equal to eight. Uh, but for kind of exploring all the possible solutions uh, to this problem, uh, we need something like a, a deeply nested for loop where we try all the positions uh, in, in row one, and then, uh, sorry, all the positions, all the different rows for column one, then for column two, and, and so on. And this is essentially what our backtracking uh, code is going to do, but we're going to use recursion to write this code in a much more elegant way. Uh, before we get to the recursive code, I want to make our lives a little easier and assume the existence of a board object that can keep track of the low-level details of the problem. So here's what our board object is going to do for us. We're going to be able to construct a board of a given size. So the eight queens problem, we would construct it with size eight, an eight by eight board, but we're going to make it uh, be able to have a board of any size. We're going to be able to test whether a spot on the board is safe, meaning that no queen currently threatens that, that, that spot with a, with a row specified by row and column. We're going to have a way to place a queen on the board. And because backtracking involves, if we hit a dead end, going back to the last choice we made and making a different choice, we're going to need to be able to remove queens from the board. Uh, and so that's going to be our remove method. And we might also want to be able to print out the board and ask the board what size it is. So uh, we could go through and, and implement this board class, but that's not the backtracking code that we're interested in. So we're just going to assume that we have such a class to work with. So we're going to want to prompt the user uh, for a board size and then construct a board of that size. And then we're going to have a method solve that takes in one of these board objects and is going to print out the possible uh, solutions for placing queens on that board. Now, as is often the case when writing a recursive program, uh, we start off and, and find that we want the recursion to work in a different way. We might want it to have more parameters or a different return value, uh, something like that. And so it's very common to write a recursive helper method that does the actual recursion, and that's what we'll do here. So we're going to have a private method, explore, uh, that is going to do the actual recursive search through different possibilities. And in thinking through what parameters this needs, uh, it needs the board object. It needs to be able to uh, check if spaces are safe and put queens on the board and so on. Uh, and another thing is that each of these recursive calls to explore is going to handle placing a queen in a different column. And so the explore method is also going to need to know what column it's currently working in. When writing a backtracking algorithm, we don't want to waste our time exploring dead ends. Uh, so it's worth thinking about the precondition for this explore method. What are we going to assume is already the case? if we say have explore of a board and column four. So we've already placed queens in columns one, two, and three, and I'm calling explore to place a queen in column four. Would that make sense if the first three queens were not placed in such a way that the solution would be valid? No, if, if the first three queens are placed so that they threaten each other, then it's not worth spending time placing the fourth queen. We're already at a dead end. and so. Our precondition for this explore method is that it's going to be that queens have already been placed safely in the previous columns. Since this is going to be recursive, we're going to want to think about our base case and our recursive cases. We might ask for the base case, all right, what column would it be nice to get to? Uh, you might say eight, because when we get to eight, that's the last column uh, we're placing. But getting to column eight 
means that seven of the eight queens have been placed safely and we're currently placing eight. So it might be even better if we say our base case is when we get to column nine, by our precondition, when we're at column nine, that means the queens in columns one through eight have already been uh, safely placed. And that actually means that we have a working solution. So actually when my column is greater than my board size, right? When we're in column nine for an eight by eight board, I'm just gonna print out the board because it's one of the actual solutions to our eight queens problem. So the else here is going to be our recursive case. So what should we do here? Uh, for example, let's say that we have four queens that have already been placed and we've been, and this call to explore is placing a queen in column five. Uh, we have eight rows in column five where we might place a queen. So we might write a for loop uh, for int row equals one up to the board size. Uh, and we're, so we're looping through all the rows in our column. And what would we want to do for each one? Well, first we want to say like, is it possible to place a queen here safely as part of a solution to eight queens? Because if it's not, we're at a dead end and it's not worth exploring putting a queen in that place. So we'd say if it's safe to put a queen in this row in the current column, then we have to ask, all right, we do want to explore this possibility. How do we do that? Uh, we do that by placing a queen in that column. That's the first step to exploring it, right? We're going to place, uh, this is a safe place to try a queen uh, in this column. So we're going to put it there. And then we're going to make our recursive call to explore to say, all right, we've placed a queen in this column. Explore how we might place a queen in the next column, call plus one. But what if that doesn't work? What if we've placed the queen in such a way like I did with the, the four by four example? What if we placed a queen in such a way that there are no possible solutions that involve that choice? Well, that's a dead end and we want to move on to the next possibility and explore it. But there's more to that than just coming around the for loop another time because we've placed a queen there. And so we need to undo that choice before we can move on and try the next possibility. So that's what our code will do. If this is a safe place to place a queen, we'll put the queen there, we'll explore further possibilities based on the choice we just made. And once we've finished exploring those possibilities, we'll undo that choice so that we can try a new one. And this is very common in recursive backtracking. We're going to make a choice, we're going to explore, and then we're going to unmake that choice. And if we go all the way through this loop, that means that we've explored all possible uh, solutions um, that involve all the previous choices we've made. So then our recursive method can just return and it will uh, undo the choice that led to this and try new choices from there. And that turns out to be all we need for this recursive backtracking code. That we, if we have uh, reached column nine, we have a solution, we can print it out. Otherwise, we're gonna try putting a queen in each row if it's safe and then based on that choice, explore further possibilities, undo that choice, and continue trying other ones. Now all we need is to add some code to our solve method that just took uh, the board, and we just explore starting in column one, and that's all we need. It might be helpful to have a visual demonstration of how this is working, so I switched over to VS Code where I have open uh, the Queens project that is linked from the notes and I can run uh, this Queens program, which has this same explore and solve uh, method that I just worked through. And if I run this program, uh, it will print out, ask me what size of board do I want to use? Maybe I say four, and it will print out the two solutions uh, to a four by four board. I can run it again. 
and ask it to find all the ways to do an 8x8 board. Turns out there are, are a number of them uh, that, that it finds. And what about a 2x2 two two board? Turns out there are, if you just have a 2x2, two two, there's no way to put two queens on there such that they don't threaten each other. So there's even something niftier in this Queen's project, and that is a visual representation of this backtracking search. So let's say I want to search the 8x8, and I can see a visual representation of, all right, I tried this choice, I found a choice for the second column that worked, for the third column that worked, for the fourth column that worked, fifth column that worked, couldn't find anything in the sixth column, so it went back and undid its choice for the fifth column and found another one, couldn't do that, so it's found that the fourth column choice was bad, and it's going to just continue this, make a choice, explore from there, once you hit a dead end, undo the previous choice, and try something else. All right, we can make this go a little faster. When it finds the solution, it will stop and celebrate for a bit. And so this is uh, our visualization of how this recursive backtracking is working. And for lab four, you will be implementing your own recursive backtracking method to find words on a boggle board. And with that, I look forward to seeing your questions about binary search and recursive backtracking.